Hi everyone, I'm Quintero Maxwell. And I'm Eric Garcia. And this is our PowerPoint presentation on psychopathy. Okay, so what is psychopathy? So across several different fields, there are many definitions of what a psychopath is. And there's a slight debate and controversy about whose definition is correct. And it, it varies depending on the situation that you're in. So the first definition that we're going to talk about is a social definition. And this is the idea that um, society generally tends to have about what a psychopath is. And we get these ideas generally from television shows and uh, movies and books and things like that. So in these mediums, a uh, psychopath is someone who's emotionally disturbed and highly neurotic and psychotic. And they tend to be extremely violent and inhumane. And they're portrayed as a loner or um, someone that's extremely antisocial and who's socially isolated and they sometimes can be developmentally challenged. However, this is not necessarily always the truth. There is also a legal definition of psychopathy and it is an individual with an abnormal personality characterized by irresponsibility, lack of emotional control, impulsiveness resulting in unstable adaptations to the environment. This legal definition is usually used in competency hearings or when it comes to the ability to stand trial. Um, there is also a psychological definition which uses measures like the PCLR or the PPI to determine certain characteristics. Characteristics which include lack of empathy, shallow affect, superficial charm, insincere, an egotistical and selfish attitude and a lack of future thinking and a failure of response modulation. And response modulation is basically the inability to deviate from a default response regardless of the situation that you're in. So they're kind of stuck in, in their response and it, it's hard for them to understand that they need to change what they're doing. Now Dr. Hervey Cleckley wrote the book The Mask of Sanity an attempt to clarify some issues about the so-called psychopathic personality. And here he essentially pointed out 16 specific traits and behaviors which all come together to form a specific profile about the psychopath. And this profile includes 16 unique traits and behaviors. And although we typically associate psychopaths with violence, it's not always the case. Psychopaths are split into three categories primary psychopaths, secondary psychopaths, and dissocial psychopaths. Not all of them have the same characteristics and not all of them are necessarily violent. Okay, so now we're going to discuss the types of psychopaths that Eric just mentioned. So the first is the primary psychopath and the book stressed that this is the only true psychopath and this person has certain identifiable psychological, emotional, cognitive and biological differences that distinguish him or her from the general or criminal population. And these characteristics are thought to be genetic in origin. And they include things like we that, that Cleckley actually pointed out, such as superficial charm and egocentrism, um, also manipulation um, and pathological lying, risky sexual behaviors, lack of realistic future planning, um, hedonistic actions and behaviors, um, and irresponsibility. And um, a subtype of the primary psychopath is the criminal psychopath. Um, and these psychopaths engage in persistent antisocial or criminal behavior. Um, and these behaviors are not always violent. Um, some psychopaths have antisocial personality disorder, but not all people with antisocial personality disorder are necessarily psychopaths. Um, and this is because the uh, diagnosis of ASPD is too narrow um, because it restricts its definition to behavioral indicators. And a very good example of a primary psychopath is the killer Ted Bundy. As Cleckley pointed out in one of his articles, the reason why I say Ted Bundy is a good example of a primary psychopath is because his profile fits pretty well with these 16 uh, traits that a psychopath has. Among them being was that he was charming and charismatic, he was a narcissist, he also had antisocial personality disorder and had a lack of empathy or remorse for his crimes. He was also very egocentric, very 
very arrogant. He, as some of you may know, he tried to defend his own case in court. And that, if anything, is a sign of just how egocentric he can be. And also, his lawyer tried to argue that he wasn't competent enough to stand trial and that he had no real sense of of his actions, no real understanding of his actions. And he was also very manipulative and he was also very hedonistic as well, which is influence, and not influence. It's uh, shown by his killings and through the methods he used to kill his victims. Many people actually um, had the same kind of perception that the general public has about psychopaths. People thought that there had to be some type of physical deformation or that they had to have some type of mental disorder for them to be psychopaths, but when people took notice of Ted Bundy and realized what a true psychopath is like, then that changed the public's perception and they realized that a psychopath does not have to look like a monster to be a psychopath. Okay, so the next type of psychopath is the secondary psychopath. And according to the textbook, um, these psychopaths commit antisocial or violent acts because of severe emotional problems or inner conflicts. And these uh, emotional problems and inner conflicts generally come from uh, parental abuse and rejection. Um, these psychopaths display more emotional instability and impulsivity than primary psychopaths, which, make them, which makes them appear to be more aggressive and violent. Um, Synonyms for this type of psychopath include acting out neurotics, neurotic delinquents, symptomatic psychopaths, and emotionally disturbed offenders. And the third type of psychopath is the dissocial psychopath. This type of psychopath displays aggressive antisocial behavior that they have learned from their subculture like gangs or their families. So it would appear that this type of psychopath is very much formed by his or her environment and the people in it. And while these two uh, second classes of psychopath are labeled like that, it's actually very misleading. The label psychopath is a, a very misleading type of label to classify them, especially because the only reason that the social and secondary psychopaths are labeled as such is because of their high recidivism rates. But as Quintero said before, the only true psychopath is the primary. Yeah, it's important to also note that secondary and dissocial psychopaths do not share many of the same characteristics and qualities as the primary psychopath. Yes, they may all be labeled psychopaths, but they actually have very little to nothing in common with the primary. Yay. Now, these are the causes of what can contribute or form a psychopath. Environmental causes can pertain to certain psychosocial factors such as abusive parenting and social isolation in school, and this can actually worsen genetic predispositions. Reinforcement of persistent and serious offending during childhood and adolescence is partially driven by hereditary influences. Genetics also plays a role in the formation of a psychopath. There is emerging evidence that genetics may contribute to this. And toxicity in utero or early childhood, birth difficulties, temperament, and other early developmental factors may also affect processes in the nervous system. And this can, in fact, render some children vulnerable to develop conduct problems and psychopathic characteristics in the future. I have another example of a real life figure that could fall in either or, in either environmental or genetics. Um, there was a serial killer by the name of the Night Stalker. I, I'm sure some of you have heard of him. He, I believe, was a product of both environmental and genetics because his mother used to work at a factory while she still had him in her womb. And she would breathe in toxic fumes all day while working at this factory. So 
that could be a potential factor contributing to his serial killer tendencies. In terms of environment, he was very much affected by his uncle, who was a Vietnam War veteran, and his uncle taught him how to kill small animals and would show him pictures of people that he killed in Vietnam. But the one single main contribution from his uncle was that one day when Richard Ramirez, who is the Night Stalker, was over at his uncle's house, his uncle shot and killed his wife right in front of Richard, and Richard was only two feet away. So out of everything that could have contributed to him ultimately becoming a serial killer, this is something that I believe very much molded him to ultimately become a serial killer, along with, of course, the genetic factors. Neurophysiology, these are indicators called markers that have been repeatedly found in psychopaths, and these markers have actually been found through skin conductance measures, among other tests done on the nervous system. Okay, so can a psychopath be treated? Now, like the definition of a psychopath, there is much controversy and debate about this in the psychology field. So some barriers to treatment of psychopaths are a lack of motivation to change, and because of their narcissism, extreme narcissism rather, and lack of guilt or remorse, many psychopaths don't think that they need to change at all. Um, also, with their insincerity and superficial charm, many psychopaths in treatment could appear to just go along to get along and actually won't be emotionally invested in the treatment. Also, um, in terms of manipulation, many of them may be seeking validation or attention or may have ulterior motives to participating in treatment or are trying to find some sort of secondary gain to being in treatment. So according to Salikin et al, if treatment is at all possible, it would need to be something more biologically invasive, such as psychotropic medication, gene deletion, or microscopic brain surgery. Um, one issue that I continuously found uh, when I was looking up empirically valid treatments is that out of the studies that are that have been done, much of the sample size was extremely small. Um, so their results that they found, if any of them were significant, cannot really be generalized to the population. And um, most studies showed changes in behavioral symptoms of psychopathy versus actual changes in cognition or any core contributors to, any mental core contributors to their psychopathy. And there is also some question about whether treatment could worsen a psychopath. However, in De Silva et al's research, they didn't find any evidence to substantiate that claim. In conclusion, although there are many definitions as to what a psychopath is, the primary psychopath is the only true psychopath. Researchers believe that biology, genetics, neurology, and psychosocial factors all contribute to the making of a psychopath. And to date, there is no single intervention that is significantly effective in the treatment of psychopaths. So. This was our presentation. We hope you enjoyed it and that you found it very informative. And we can't wait to see what your responses to your questions will be. Yes, get ready for some debates and really thought-provoking questions. Thank you. Thank you.